We appreciate that good singing. We surely do. Appreciate our choir as always. Good to be here this morning. I appreciate you being here in your place. Uh, I'm going to ask you for your attention over the next while while we preach. Every message we preach, every lesson that is taught is always important. Uh, however, some seem to stand out a little bit, and I want to make sure that you carry them home with you, and this is one of those days uh, that I just want your, your full attention. Uh, I, I told them Wednesday night if they knew someone that needed the Lord lost, undone without God, to bring them today if they could. Encourage them to watch, whether online or what. The message will stay up online. If you have someone within your family or a friend that needs to know the Lord, uh, direct them to the website. Direct them to the, uh, to the YouTube recording of what we will talk about today. And I've entitled this message, Someone Has Died. Now what? Someone has died. Now what? The Bible says in the book of Job, chapter 14, in verse 14, if a man die, shall he live again? It's a question. It's a question that many people ask. It's a question that is answered in many, many ways. You can turn with me to the ninth chapter of Hebrews if you want to be turning. And I'm going to read a verse there here in a few moments, and then we'll go to Luke chapter number 16. But in this life, many things occur that happen. And when they happen, we know what the next thing is going to happen. In other words, we know what occurrence is going to follow certain actions. It's always the same, or should be. Uh, when you drive home, now the, the way I go home, this won't occur to me, but if you go out here and you turn left down Highway 152, and you're going out to 150 to go either east or west, depending on where you live, when you get to the end of the road down there, there's two things. There's a Dollar General, that's the end of every road, and there's a red light. And when you're coming down through there and you see that light is yellow, you know that it's going to be red next, right? It doesn't go yellow and then green. It goes yellow and then red. We know that. So we know when we see the yellow light that it's going to turn red. So uh, if we're doing things the way we should, we start to slow down. If you're riding with me, you probably feel it speed up, depending on how close we are. But it means red's coming. So there's things that happen in our life every day that we know what the next occurrence is going to be. They're just normal things that happen in our lives. And we know that. But not one person that is here today, not one person that would be listening online, not one person that will ever watch this message has ever died and can tell us what the next stage is. You've not. Anybody here died this week and, and you say, well, preacher, I can tell you what happened because I've, I've been there. No, you haven't. So we don't know. What we have is the Word of God. But we do not fully understand, nor can we fully, I believe, comprehend everything that's going to occur when we die. And that's something I want to try to talk about this morning. Job 14, 14 again. If a man die, shall he live again? Question, understand that Job asked this question during the midst of losing everything that he had. His family, his wealth, he was losing everything that he had, that he had in this world. He was losing it. And he asked this question, if a man live, uh, die, shall he live again? What Job was saying was if there is hope, that lies beyond the grave, then I can deal with the tragedy that is going on right now in my life. If I just know that when the time comes that I die and all these things, that I know I'll live again in His presence, if that is the case, if that is my hope, then I can survive through the troubles and the trials that this life is dealing me. Same for you and I. We all have our uh, troubles and trials that we face. We all have problems within our lives. There's nobody here 
that's not exempt from problems, not exempt from family problems, exempt from work problems. Uh, we call that life. Amen? Now, with that said, I do not want you to think I'm minimizing or minimalizing your problems. They're real to you. They're large to you. And some are much larger than other problems. I understand that. But I don't know if anybody right now is going through the problems that Job had. And Job said, if a man die, will he live again? He's simply saying, boy, if I know that to be the truth, I can make it through this. Because I know a better day is coming. Well, of course, the answer to Job's question is yes. If a man trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, gets saved by the grace of God, he will live again. Amen? Can I say to you here today, if you've been saved by the grace of God, the grave is not the end. Amen? You will live again in the presence of a holy God for all of eternity if you've placed your hope and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But before we see what the Bible has to tell us about what happens after we die, let's, let's, let, I want to address some things that the world tells us. Number one, the world, some of the world tells us that you just cease to exist. In other words, when you're dead, you're dead. When you die, there's nothing else. You're gone, you're annihilated. It's just as if you never lived to begin with. No such thing as an eternal soul. No such thing as living forever. When you die and the last breath leaves your life, it's just over. It's what the world would tell you. The world, some religions in the world also teach in reincarnation. Well, what is reincarnation? Reincarnation means that as you live, depending on whether you do good or do bad, when you die, you're going to be reincarnated, you're going to be recreated into something else that comes back and lives again. In other words, if you've lived good, you come back as something better than you were before. If you've lived bad, then you come back as something worse. I mean, you could come back as an animal, or you could come back as a leader, whatever. It just depends on how you lived your life. This is what reincarnation teaches us. Others teach, and I had this question, I, I've told them on Wednesday night, I had a girl call me the other day that has nothing to do with our church. Nobody here except my wife would know her. And she called me about a Bible study they were having and, uh, at their place. And during that Bible study, the minister that they had was from a different denomination. And he talked about uh, when you die, that your soul just goes into a, a type of hibernation. In other words, soul sleep. She called me, and I haven't got to finish having the conversation. She said, is this true or not? Before I could end, I just simply said, no, it's not. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Let God be true and every man a liar. So there's no such thing as soul sleep. But they teach that your soul just sleeps or goes into this, uh, this state of hibernation until the final resurrection. This is taught in our Seventh-day Adventist churches. This is taught by Jehovah's Witnesses and many other cults teach of soul sleep. Others teach of a universal immorality. What do I mean there? They believe that God is good. Because God is good, God would never condemn anyone. In other words, it is a belief that Everyone on the earth will be universally restored at some point in time when they die. And everyone, regardless of how they lived, what they did do, what they didn't do, doesn't matter. Everyone will eventually end up redeemed and in heaven. It's not true. But this is what the world is teaching. And many times taught to our young children. One more. Mormonism teaches, and I'm going to read you some things straight off of their website, all right? It said, we either go to a spirit world or to a place called paradise. 
People who received the gospel and were baptized into Christ's church by someone having authority in this life go to paradise to wait to be judged according to the works and deeds in life and to be rejoined with their resurrected, renewed bodies. If you didn't have the opportunity to accept the gospel in this life, then you will have the opportunity to learn more about it in the spirit world and will have the opportunity to accept it there as you are waiting to be resurrected. Thanks to our Savior Jesus Christ, we will all live again. My purpose today is not to talk ill of other denominations, but right is right and wrong is wrong. And I cannot condone a lie. And this is a lie. It's a lie. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 9, because ultimately this is all that matters. It doesn't matter what any denomination teaches, including the Baptist, if it doesn't line up with this book. So we have to look here for our answers. It's truth. It's the only truth. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27, the Bible simply says this, pardon me, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let me read it again. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be here today. Lord, I thank you for those that are here. Father, I pray that we would give our complete and total attention to the Word of God today. May we hear as you speak to us, Lord God, about this subject. Something that uh, even Christians do not fully understand, don't look forward to, Lord. Nobody wants to die. But Lord, I'm thankful that we know by the Word of God, that the grave is not the end. We know those that we've planted in the graveyard that were saved by the grace of God, we will see them again one day. We have a hope that lies beyond the grave. Paul said, if we have hope in this life only, we are of all men most miserable. But Lord, we know that we have a hope that lies beyond the grave. We know that a lot of lies have been taught, have been preached, have been told to many. But Lord God, what does the Word of God have to tell us today about the moments that will happen after death? Father, I thank you and I love you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'll get to my message here, and we won't be too lengthy once we get there, but, but we need to get some things straight before we get there. And I think we need to understand this. I want us to see three things out of this one verse that we just read. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Three things I think we should see there. Number one, death is certain. It has been appointed, amen? You are going to die. I don't know, maybe some of you didn't realize that. But you are going to die. Our young people back there, you are going to die someday, sometime. It is appointed. It has been set by God. It is an appointment that you cannot escape. If God tarries and doesn't come back for the church, we are each and every one of us going to die. The writer of the Hebrews knew this, and he was trying to encourage the people within the church, uh, knowing that their bodies were frail, knowing that every step they took was one step closer to death, knowing that from the moment we are born, we begin to die. We have a certain number of days on this earth. And when those days come to a close, you can do not one thing to add a moment more to your life. Now, you may not believe it by looking at me or watching me when we have a dinner, but I do think it's good to exercise, to eat right, to stay as healthy as you can. All these things are great, but it is an appointed time that we're going to die. You cannot escape it. You cannot escape death. You can be the most healthy person that there is. Death will find you one day. I'm not trying to bring you down, so stay with me. 
I don't want you to leave here sad because you, you knew you were going to die when you showed up. Amen? We've everyone here probably been to a funeral of somebody close to us that has gone on. Some at a very young age was just thinking about Brother Tim Pope when you were singing that song. Brother Tim, when is it, I believe he's in his mid-60s. Is what? Still 60? So he was in his early, he was just turned 60. And he's gone on to be with the Lord. But by his testimony, I believe he's gone on to be with the Lord. Others that, that we've buried uh, uh, may have been 80s, 90s, 100 years old. The older you, have you noticed how the older you get, the next decade doesn't seem as old as it used to? I'm 59, I'll be 60 in April. 60 sounds young to me now. When I was 30, 60 was like ancient. It seems young to me. And when I get in my 60s, 70s, it's going to seem young to me. But either way, God knows when the appointed time is. And I have a limited number of days on this earth. And I am going to die one day if the Lord doesn't come back. Even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. I'd love to escape the grave. Being honest, I'd love to escape the grave. Even so come Lord Jesus. I'm ready to go. I don't have to go back home for nothing. The dogs can fend for themselves. I am ready to go meet the Lord. That doesn't mean I want to die. It means I'm not afraid to die. I want to do everything God has for me to do here on this earth as long as I can. But when my time comes, don't worry about me. Because I'll live again. I will live again. So death is appointed. It's not an option. It's not like you take a, a piece of paper and you're filling out something and you check a box. I want to die. Check. I think I, I don't want to die. Check. Doesn't work that way. It's not an option. It's been ordered of the Lord. It has been appointed to every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, everyone. It is an appointed time that they are going to die. Whether you're the rich man, and we'll talk about in a minute, whether you're the poor man, uh, whether, whether you're the educated, whether you're the uneducated, whether you're black, white, green, yellow, doesn't matter. It's appointed to every man that he's going to die. And if you know that's going to happen, should you not make preparations? I'm telling you today, you cannot escape death. And so if you know that death is coming to your door one day, and you know that you're going to close your eyes in death, should you not desire to make preparations prior to that happening? Because I'm telling you, uh, those four or five different things I told you about that the world believes are not true. It's what the Bible says that matters. But I choose to believe this. It doesn't matter what you choose. It's what the Bible says. Well, I choose just to believe that everything will be okay. Doesn't matter what you choose. It's what the Bible says. That's the only thing that matters is the Word of God. So death, it is an appointment, and we all have that appointment. And as you get older, I guess, you realize that death is absolutely no respecter of age, gender, race, Social status, doesn't matter. When it comes time to die, you can't bargain with death. But death, you don't understand who I am. You don't understand who my family is. You don't understand how influential we are. Death doesn't care. When he comes for you, it's an appointment you'll have to keep. Life gets in the way of a lot of things, you know. Uh, well, many times we have to reschedule, don't we? We have to reschedule dentist appointments. We have to reschedule doctor's appointments. Things get in the way and call them up and say, I'm just not going to be able to come. I need to reschedule. Most time, no problem. And they'll reschedule you for a later date. Death is not that way. You don't reschedule death. Death is an appointment that we will keep. Why? Because it is appointed. It has been appointed by God. The Word of God. And as it is appointed unto men wants to die. My second point there, second thing out of that verse, is that death is consistent. What do I mean? Well, once. In other words, what does it say again? As it is appointed unto men once to die. When something occurs once, it only occurs one time, right? 
In other words, you are not like a cat. You don't get nine lives, amen? The proverbial nine lives. You don't get that. You get one shot at this thing called life. That's it. You're born into this world physically one time. You will die one time physically. You don't get another shot. You don't get to say, well, I'll do better next time. I'll learn from what my mistakes I made this time, and, and I'll do better next time. It does not work that way. You get one shot at this thing called life. You are going to be born one time physically. You are going to die once. Once. And it's not like things that we try, and if we fail, we get to try again. It doesn't work that way. One shot at this thing called life. There is no extensions. You know, April 15th is tax day. If you can't get it done, you can file an extension. You can push it out. They still want their money up here. But you can push the paperwork out until you get it all done. There are no extensions with death. When the appointed time comes, you're going to die. You say, boy, preacher, this ain't a very shouting message. It can be. Amen? It can be. Third thing out of that verse, and then I'll get to the message. The last thing I want you to see, the Bible says, and it is appointed, God sets the appointment, unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That word judgment can also mean justice. In other words, the moment we close our eyes in death, our eternal destiny has been sealed. I want you to understand that so clearly. The moment that the last breath leaves your body, you are dead and your eternity has been sealed and set. Purgatory is a lie. There is no such thing as purgatory. You can pray the priest as, pay the priest as much as you want. He cannot pray someone out of hell. When we make our choices and our decisions on this side of the grave, whether we're going to accept Christ, whether we're going to reject Christ, will be made on this side of the grave. Because once we take our last breath, our destiny is set and sealed. It's that important. So if, if you believe what I'm telling you, and I'm telling you what the Bible says, and if you believe that, and you believe that it's been appointed unto you that you're going to die one day, and you're going to only have one shot at it, you're going to die one time. And if you believe that, and if you believe your destiny is going to be sealed, well, does it not make sense to make the preparations ahead of time? Well, I'll do it tomorrow. Your appointment's been set. When is it? You don't know. Is it worth risking that you'll be here tomorrow? Or next week? That whole back row is filled full of young people, and I'm so thankful to see them. And some of them are in their teens, some of them are in their 20s. They think they're going to live forever. How do I know that? Because I was a teenager one time, amen? And I thought I'd live forever. I could do whatever I wanted to do. I mean, death is for old people, right? Right? That's what they think. That's what you think when you're young. Well, death is for old people. I've still got to live my life. And I'll live till I'm 40 or 50. You know, that's ancient when you're their age. And I'll live till I'm 40. And then I'll, then I'll do what you're talking about, preacher. And then I'll worry about this and worry about that. And then I'll worry about getting saved. And I'll worry about living right then. Our graveyard is filled full of people that are in their teens and 20s and 30s and 40s and weeks old, and months old. There's no respecter of persons. Judgment's going to come. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians uh, 5 and 10, Paul said this to the Corinthian church, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We will be judged at the moment of death. We will be judged according to what we've done good and bad. You will be judged according, listen to me closely, you will be judged according to what you have done with Jesus. 
What have you done with Jesus? What have I done? I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. I bowed on my knees and I asked God to forgive me of my sins. I asked him to come into my heart and life and be my Lord and Savior. And thank God he did. And I'm redeemed, born, by, born again by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heaven is my home. I'm hell proof standing here today. I have no doubts about that. It's what I chose to do with Jesus. Other people, we read a list every Wednesday night of people that need to be born again uh, just from the, the amount of the people in this church, and it could be much larger than it is. We read that list every Wednesday night. They have chosen to reject Jesus as Savior. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. We will be judged according to what we've done with Jesus. Turn with me to the book of Luke. Chapter number 16. I'm going to read some very familiar verses there. I'm not going to take time to read all of it because you know the story when it deals with the rich man and the beggar. The rich man and Lazarus here. I want us to see some things here that I think will help to clear some things up. In these verses that we're going to read, I'm going to pull out of them. I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing. But Jesus is going to give you and I a very clear, detailed picture of what happens the moment after death. Someone has died. Now what? Jesus is going to give you a very clear picture of what happened to the rich man in the moments, and to Lazarus, in the moments after they died. When it comes to the rich man, if you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can insert your name in these verses in place of the rich man if you've never been saved by the grace of God. I'm going to give you about three things. I'm going to do it as quickly as I can, but I'm not going to rush. In my Bible, it is headed, the heading over these verses, starting in verse number 19, is the rich man and the beggar. We know the story there. The rich man dies, the beggar dies, and they both go out into eternity. And we're going to see the difference. Number one, I'm mainly going to deal with the rich man, the lost. You see, I've had people ask me, well, when you die and you're, you're, you're a child of God and, and you, you believe that wants to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, and you're going to go in the presence of Jesus, and, and what all is going to happen at that moment? My response is normally this. I don't fully understand all that, but I'm not worried about it. Let Jesus take care of it. All I was worried about was making sure I was getting there. Amen? I just know it's going to be good. I know it's going to be wonderful to be in the presence of a holy God. I know it, it's going to be greater than I could ever imagine. But I want to talk more about the lost man, the rich man here. I'm going to give you three things that the Word of God shows us here. Probably more, but three that we've pulled out. The very moment after death. The rich man is taking his last breath on this earth. What happened? Number one, all of his worldly accomplishments are meaningless and irrelevant. What does the Bible say here? Let's start in verse number 19, read through 22. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked, the, licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now think about that. It tells us here a couple things. This man here was the Jeff Bezos, the Bill Gates, the Elon Musk, the Donald Trump of his day. He had the fine linen, the Bible says. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. That, that, that showed royalty and, 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 and upscale, and, and, and he was rich, and he fared sumptuously every day. In other words, this man had everything at his disposal that this world offered. I didn't look up the wealth of Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. 
I know they're getting close to me, but I don't worry about them. I didn't look them up. I'll talk about Bill Gates in a moment. I did look his up. But these men, these men could lose a billion dollars, a billion, and their life wouldn't change. They can make a billion dollars and their life doesn't change. Anything and everything that this world has to offer, from airplanes to yachts to the, to the greatest trips to whatever, everything wonderful that this world has to offer, they have at their disposal. They are not limited to one thing in this world. Nothing. There is nothing in this world that they can't buy. There's nothing in this world that they can't have and enjoy the things of this world. You mean the things of this world are enjoyable? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible calls them the pleasures of sin. There's a lot. And listen, everything in this world is not bad either. Don't misunderstand me. It's where we prioritize it that makes it bad. But this man here had everything. He had the designer clothes, the, the purple and fine linen. He only ate the very highest and most delicate, uh, delicacies that there could be, the greatest delicacies. His table would have the best food, no doubt, you could get. And if he didn't like it, somebody would bring him something different. He was the one that everybody desired to be. He's the one that everybody said, if I just had that kind of money, I could finally be happy. I could finally do what I wanted to do. I could be happy. That was this man. He fared sumptuously every single day. But then the Bible says in verse number 22, the rich man also died and was buried. Well, that's pretty short, isn't it? That's not saying much about somebody that's, uh, that's had everything. It just says that he died and he was buried. Just like everyone else. When it comes your time to die, the moment after you die, all of your worldly accomplishments, all, everything becomes meaningless. It becomes irrelevant. All the things that you thought were, were so important in this life, all the things that you thought you had to have, all the things that you chose to put before a holy God, all the things you put before your family, all the things truthfully you put before your own happiness, all those things become irrelevant when we die. They're meaningless. They could not buy him one more breath on this side of eternity. They could not change his eternity. He could not buy his, say, buy his way into heaven. He could not buy his way into happiness. Everything that he had is gone for someone else. He died. He was buried. I told you I looked up Bill Gates. We all, we've all heard the name Bill Gates. He's 67 years old now. And he's worth a... A paltry $108 billion. $108 billion. My mind can't even compute that. You know, if you, most of us here, if not all of us, if you were to get a $5,000, $10,000 bonus at your job, you would begin to think about how this could change things in your life, how you could... You could finally do this or maybe take that trip or, or you could update your car or, or pay off something. This, you know, we begin to think about that. When you're dealing in these numbers, $108 billion, none of that matters. Nothing changes your lifestyle. Financially wise, I'm talking about. $108 billion. One of the most rich men in America and the world. One of the most powerful men in America and in the world. And yet he said in an interview years ago, and I'm hoping things have changed since then. But I didn't write down the date. But an interviewer simply asked him if he attended church on Sundays. His response was, there's a lot more I could be doing on Sunday mornings. There's a lot more I could be doing on Sunday mornings. But when the day comes, and I don't know when that is, but Bill Gates has an appointment. Right now, he doesn't make appointments for himself. People make appointments with him. He's catered to highly. But the day will come when he has an appointment with death and he will not miss that appointment. And when he does, he's going to find out that everything that was important to him in this life is meaningless, irrelevant. 
None of it can add one thing to his life, to, to, to his eternity. Nothing. The Bible said again, he's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Do you think God's going to ask what kind of car you drive? How much money you have in the bank? How big is your house? What kind of job do you have? Where are you at on the, on the corporate ladder? Do people know your name? Are you respected by people? Is your name up in lights? Are you known throughout the world? God doesn't care about any of that. That stuff is vanity. God doesn't care about any of that. The only thing God cares about is what did you do with Jesus? That's the only question Bill Gates will have to answer when he dies and goes out to meet God. And I hope and pray that between now and the time that he dies, that the Holy Ghost can send conviction that he would get saved by the grace of God. He could use his money for good. He could use his money to advance the kingdom of God. And he could go to heaven. He could be forgiven of his sins. We hope and pray that's the case. But the moment that you close your eyes in death, everything that you put before God, before your family, before the church, everything you couldn't find time for, you're going to find out those things are irrelevant and meaningless when it comes to eternity. Meaningless. We're here but a few short years. Some shorter than others, I told you. You don't have to be old to die. But what we do with Jesus is all that matters. Number two, in the very moment that somebody's died, now what? In that very moment that you shut your eyes in death, you begin an eternity without Christ. The Bible, listen to what the Bible says in verse 24 through 26. And he cried and said, well, let me read, I might as well read 23 while I'm reading. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So the moment we, we die, the moment we take our last breath, if you're lost, I'm talking about lost people, I shouldn't say we then, so please don't, don't misunderstand me if I, if I say it wrong. If I say we when I shouldn't. But we're talking about lost people. The moment that a lost person closes his eyes in death, he begins an eternity without Christ. Without Christ. Did you notice here the Bible said in the last verse we read that there was a great gulf fixed so that no one from hell could pass over into paradise or heaven and no one from heaven could pass over? There was a great gulf fix that would not allow that to occur. You see, a lot of people have a very wrong misconception about hell. Hell is not a place you go to learn your spiritual lessons and then eventually you'll be graduated and be able to go to heaven. It's not what the Bible teaches. It's what the world might teach, but it's not what the Bible teaches. You're not going to go to hell as you would in our, uh, in our uh, judicial system. You're not going to be incarcerated for a period of time and be paroled or, or serve your sentence and then get to escape hell and go to heaven after a period of time. That's not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches you and I is what, if somebody dies without Christ, they're going into an eternity without Christ and they're going to go to a devil's hell and they're going to stay there for an eternity. And eternity is a long, long time. So if you're going to stay in, in, in hell for an eternity, tell me what hell is like, preacher. I wish I had the adjectives to describe it. I say that, but however, I think if we, if we truly could comprehend and fully uh, conceive what hell would be like, I think it would drive us insane. 
I truly do. But the Bible does tell us some things. In fact, here in these four verses, I think three different times, it uses the word torment. Torment. The intense torments of hell are going to last forever. Some denominations teach that you die, if you go to hell, you burn up like a matchstick, and you're just gone. But that's not what the Bible teaches, is it? That's not what the Bible teaches at all. The Bible says that, that he lifted up his, his eyes in hell being in torments. He was tormented there. The Bible teaches us several things about hell. I surely won't uh, encompass them all in what I'm about to say. But it's a place of torment. It's a place of pain. It's a place of complete darkness. However, you're wrapped in eternal fire. Uh, it's a place without God. It is a place filled with hopelessness. There's no hope of ever escaping the pains and the torments of a devil's hell. How many times have you heard or seen something or heard someone else say maybe that, uh, or you might even utter these words yourself. When something bad occurs or bad happens, we say, you know, that, that's like hell on earth. It's like a living hell. The truth is nothing that occurs in this life can compare to one moment in a devil's hell. Not one. Not one. Now there are others that would say that, that God is a God of love. And to be fair, then, then He could never send anyone to such a horrible place. I want to read you two verses in the book of Galatians. And then I'll go back. Galatians chapter number 6, in verse 6 and 7, the Bible said, Let him that is taught in the Word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That simply means when someone's teaching you the Word of God, you should support that. That's what that's saying. Verse 7 says this, Be not deceived. We all know what it is to be deceived, don't we? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he all so reap. In other words, there is a direct coalition. There is a direct response in what you sow and what you reap. It is simply God, I believe it's teaching you and I that God is allowing lost people. I keep wanting to say us, but I'm talking about mankind, lost people. God is allowing lost people to experience and have in death what they chose in life. What do I mean? I'm going to give you about three things here. In life, lost people, when you've tried to tell them about Jesus, they reject the message of forgiveness. They reject the message of grace. And God is going to allow them to go to a place where there will be no forgiveness. There will be no grace in a place called hell. We reject it on this side of the grave. We will experience and live in that rejection on the other side. That's what I'm saying. How many people say, I'm tired of being bothered with you self-righteous, holy Christians that think every night everybody needs to be saved and believe like you do. I'm tired of you Christians. So God is going to allow them to die and go to a place where they will never be bothered by a Christian again. Never. There will be no Christian come by on hell's gates and knock on the door and invite you to church. There will never be a Christian come by and tell you Jesus loves you. There will be no Christians come by again. God will allow you to have what you ask for in this world. A place where people say, I don't want mercy. I don't need God's mercy. You can go to a devil's hell where there will be no mercy. All you'll experience is the wrath of a holy God. The moment you close your eyes in death, you are going into a Christless eternity. Now I'm going to give you some Robology here. For those that may not have heard me use that term, Robology is what I believe, but I may not be able to prove it to you 100% with the Word of God. Here's some Robology. So you can disagree with me on what I'm going to say Robology-wise. You can disagree with me and I won't argue with you. Everything else I've said up to this point, if you disagree, you're disagreeing with the Word of God. My Robology, this is what I believe. I believe in hell that you're going to be reminded 
And I believe, I believe I can come close to proving this to you by the Word of God. We're going to have our senses in hell. You're going to feel, you're going to hear, you're going to touch, you're going to smell, all that. You're going to have those senses in hell. And I believe that if you're here today or you're watching online or you watch this down the road a year from now and you, and you, and you choose rather to reject the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I believe this message today will be played over and over again throughout eternity in hell where God proven to you you had the chance to be saved. You rejected, you chose hell over heaven. It will ring in your ears and I believe that will be part of the punishments of hell is knowing that you had opportunity to be saved, knowing that a preacher loved you enough to tell you the truth, knowing that your Sunday school teacher loved you enough to teach you the truth, knowing that that Christian come by loved you enough just to simply say, God loves you, but you'll never be bothered with that again. But I believe that will ring through your mind for all of eternity. So the moment after death, when we close our eyes, eternity begins without Christ. One more point. The moment after death, what you didn't care about in life, evangelizing, becomes very important. Look what the Word of God says. Verse 27, verse 28. Then He said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. This rich man, I'm sure, on this side of eternity, on this side of the grave, he had never one time told his brothers they needed to go to church. Never one time told them God loved them. Never one time told them they needed to be saved. It wasn't important. Earning money, being the big man, that's what was important. And now that he lift his eyes up in hell in torments, he's begging Abraham to send Lazarus to go and speak to his brothers that they wouldn't come to such a terrible place evangelism has become mission one for this rich man evangelism so church if you're here or not church but lost people if you're listening to me you hear this message and you're lost and undone without God I'm telling you when you die and go to hell that it'll be your greatest wish that your family didn't have to come I hear people say, it's going to be a big party in hell. I can't wait to get there. Me and my friends will party all through eternity in hell. There'll be no parties in hell. It's one eternal death. And it'll last for all of eternity in fire and brimstone and torment for all of eternity. And the one thing you'll wish for is that someone, that Christian that used to bother you by knocking on your door... That Christian that may, used to uh, make you get up out of your easy chair and come to the door, you'd give anything if that Christian would go tell your brothers and sisters about Christ that they need not come to this place of torment. What do you think this rich man was going through for him to be so concerned? But here's the key. At that point in time, it's too late. It's too late to influence your loved ones. It's too late to tell your, your neighbors. It's too late to tell your brothers and sisters about a place called hell and they need to escape it. Now is the time to tell them. Now's the time for us Christians to keep knocking on the doors, to keep saying God loves you, to keep sharing the good news of the gospel that Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son, died for our sins. Rose again the third day, victorious over death, hell, and the grave, that you and I could be forgiven of our sins, that heaven could be our eternal home. Now is the time. Not next week. Not the week after. Now. It is appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. You see, many, many parents, most parents would do anything for their children. And we do everything we can for our children. And we try to provide for them physically and give them everything they need in this world to be successful, right? Is, is it not every parent's goal that their children uh, would, be, would do better than they did? That's in every one of us. But at the same time, our first goal should be to make sure they're saved by the grace of God. I can honestly tell you, I told both my boys, I hope they have successful careers. I hope they do well. Hope they can provide for their families. 
But I do not care if they dig ditches for a living by hand. I don't care if that's what they do, if they're in God's will and if they're saved by the grace of God. Both of my boys have made a profession of faith. I led them both to the Lord. I baptized them both. And now I've got to work on my granddaughters. They have to be saved. You know, I get, we went through, walked through Sam's Club the other day and they had these little electric battery powered motorcycles. And they changed gears and everything. And Karen said, boy, I'd love to get the girls something like that for Christmas. That's great. We want to give them things, right? But the greatest thing you can give them is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing that will last beyond the grave. Anything else I choose to buy them, to give them, or even do for them outside of Christ is meaningless, is irrelevant when they close their eyes in death. And if time stands, and I hope, if time does stand, I hope that they live a long life and, and I die before they do. But the only thing I can leave behind for them is the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That should be a parent, a grandparent's number one goal is to tell them about Jesus. I'm going to close. Just the moment after we close our eyes in death, the very next moment, everything you've accomplished in this life will be meaningless and irrelevant to eternity. The moment you close your eyes in death, you begin an eternity if you're lost without Christ. If you're saved, you begin an eternity with Christ. If you're lost, like the rich man, an eternity without Christ. And the last thing was there was a great desire of the rich man to see his loved ones come to the Lord. Why would we not do that now? Why would we not? And I don't mean parents shouldn't just tell their children to go to church. We're going to send our church bus out next Sunday for the inaugural run. We're hoping to get kids on. Doug's going to drive it. We've got other people going to be on it. We're hoping to get kids and bring them. If we don't get any next week, we're going to try again another week. What kids need is not so much to be sent to church as parents that are saved by the grace of God to teach them about Jesus through actions and through words. So why would you wait if you're lost? Let's all stand. All heads bowed just for a moment and all eyes closed. I'm sure most people here today, if I just flat out ask you if you've been saved by the grace of God, your answer would be yes. But maybe not everyone. I would not play with eternity. If I was one of the young people on the back row. If I was one of the elderly people in another row. If I would not been saved by the grace of God. I would find my way to this altar. Preacher I don't fully understand salvation. Find your way to this altar. I'll take the word of God and show you what the Bible says. It's actually very very simple. Is there one that's never been saved. That would come and allow me the privilege of reading the Romans road to you and telling you about Jesus. Before we close, I'm going to ask you this. No one would come forward and say, I've not been, I'm, I'm not been saved, I'm lost. Pray for me. If you have a, a, a child, a spouse, a close loved one in your family that's not been saved, would you come to the altar and pray for them and allow me to pray with you for them that they might get saved? Because an eternity is a long, long time. A long, long time. And it should be our goal to tell as many people about Jesus as we can. Father God, we bow in your presence. Many have come to this altar, Lord God, with lost loved ones upon their heart. And I'm sure many others, Lord, that didn't make the move. They're still in the pews, Lord, but they have loved ones upon their heart also that need to be saved. Lord, we don't know. I may mention Wednesday night, Lord, that we do not know what it would take for some of these people to come to you.
to turn from their stubborn ways. And that's what it boils down to, Lord. They're just too stubborn. And we don't know, Lord, what it will take to soften their hearts and turn them your way. But whatever it does, we pray that's exactly what you do. So, Father, we just lift up all these names that are upon the hearts of these individuals here at the altar and in the pews and and the list that we read every Wednesday night. We lift them up to you now, Lord God, asking that you'd send strong conviction their way. And if there's one here today, Lord, that's lost, doesn't know you as Savior, and just couldn't come forward, just wouldn't make that step. Lord, I pray they'd come see me at a private moment, a private time, and let me tell them about Jesus. Lord, you give us in the Word of God what we need. Lord, we know that the Bible says that God be true in every man a liar. And we know that all the things that are spoken of that are not backed up by the Word of God about what occurs after death and burn up and gone or have other opportunities, Lord, are just simply not true. The Bible says He's appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Father, hear our prayer this day and save that one closest to hell and set a fire in our hearts to evangelize and tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you, and I love you, and I'm so grateful that you're my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.